Hey, Leilani. Hi, Frederick. How are you over there? Do you, I guess you're, you're putting stuff on your fingers. Well, actually I'm in self isolation because I came back from the US a couple of days ago and my government is following the World Health Organization guideline that we stay home for 14 days. So I'm at home with my kids and my partner for 14 days, it's been, this is day four, I think. So 10 more days. Have, have In the last, now have you been a special rapporteur for like six years? Have you been home for such a long time ever? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I've only been home for a few days now, but uh, it's looking like I'll be home longer than I've ever been before, for sure. <laughs> not a bad thing, not a bad thing. Getting oh. to know my family again. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting how life suddenly changes everything this is ex it's a very extreme situation it is it's extreme and i i don't know about you but i'm finding it uh, oh, somewhat overwhelming to think through all of the implications even if i just look narrowly as the rapporteur on the right to housing all of the implications of this that is just so enormous really yeah. enormous yeah. I'm, i mean when i walk around here in malmo sweden it's like it's like a depression you know Everybody is like some heaviness on people's shoulder, or on all of our shoulders. So it's it's a very strange situation, and of course we are we are uh, almost like drug addicts on on news. Of course. And then you, all these news start to circulate, and people are getting facts from you know all sources. It's like it's it's totally messy. Yes. So I thought what we could do maybe is to talk about something else. But still related to to this this ongoing uh, public health crisis, which is now also turning to be a new financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So there are like two things that plays in to to your job. But but how do you? I mean, what is your? I I, I saw you did a little speech you sent out on yeah. Twitter today. So what yeah. is your? So from your position, what what are do you have it in quick? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of, I think there's two big pieces to this from my perspective. The What dawned on me, I mean, so obvious, but it dawned on me that governments around the world have given all of us a prescription against coronavirus. And that prescription is to stay home. And of course, when you start thinking about, well, what does that mean? You realize that Obviously, for some people, staying home is incredibly difficult and is not going to be a solution. So for homeless people, of course, they have no home, so they can't stay home. That's one. And then there are people who have inadequate housing, you know, where they don't have, they can't wash their hands, for example, right? So then that's another problem. They can't really stay home and be effective in preventing the spread of the disease. But then what worries me most, actually, is the big structural piece, and this goes to the film Push. The big structural piece is governments are really worried about their economies and they're doing taking action. They're sinking a huge amount of money into business, but they're also doing something else, which is lowering interest rates. And we know that that then creates these conditions where people are going to be foreclosing on their mortgages. That creates a lot of cheap debt low interest rates, that means that the big financial actors so so easily could do exactly what they did in 08 and thereafter, and what push documents. And I'm really, why I say I'm most worried about that piece, of course, I'm worried about people suffering coronavirus and dying. I mean, don't get me wrong, and homeless people in particular. But that structural piece is pretty easy to ignore right now, right? Because everyone's dealing with the urgency, emergency, and and then this can happen by stealth, you know, when we're turning our way, looking at the emergencies, that's when these guys come in. I don't know if, what you think about that, but. No, I, I think it's, I mean, you can, when you see, I mean, also here in, this, in Sweden, the news is the business community are talking to the government and they are 
they're so far quite happy what the government is doing. So, but when they are happy, it doesn't necessarily always mean that we should be happy because that's the lesson from the 2008 financial crisis. The way they solved it created this kind of extreme income inequality. And that we, when we did push, we met with, with Joseph Stieglitz and he explained something for us. And let's see if we can play a little clip from the film. Uh, I, we're, we're trying this like to be like a TV show here. We are not, but uh, <laughs> we play the Joseph Stieglitz clip maybe. Let's see if it works, if it works. Yeah. It's, it's cool. So it's from, from Push. The Push is also out on Demi on Demand if you want to see it after the screen. We can put up the load. The, and then if you see this, also share with your share with your um, with your Facebook friends and so on that we are live on Facebook and invite people today because we can keep talking for a while. Uh, so now it happens something here. We own properties around the globe. We buy these investments on behalf of our companies like Blackstone or any of the big financial enterprises were the big winners in the crisis. Uh, they were the big winners in the housing market. Uh, they were also the big winners in the equity markets. It was as if the US government, rather than helping the homeowners who were losing their homes, actually sided with the banks, encouraged foreclosures to clean up the books, gave the money, to the hedge funds and, and private equity firms, who then bought the, the distressed assets to make money. So it is the way that the 2008 crisis has played an important role in increasing wealth inequality in the United States and in other countries that have been afflicted by the crisis. Yeah, so that was Stieglitz from, um, from Push. So, when you listen to him now, what do you think about what's happening today? That's like, this is like the interesting thing, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's an amazing clip to have right now as we're watching. Um, you know, I just, just, just to say, I, I, of course, I receive so much real estate information all the time on my phone. And I, I've been seeing all these ads. This home priced at this amount, it's going to sell for this amount much lower. You know, so I, we can see the whole housing market is in disarray. And these are the conditions for what Stiglitz said of creating a moment where wealth inequality will just be, a crisis will be used to create even more wealth inequality. I've been saying to governments around the world that now is the time actually to rebalance wealth inequality, I think. I think it's, I mean, it seems like a weird thing to use a crisis in this other sort of, for this other means or thing, but I think we have to start extending to people who don't have secure homes. We have to start, states have to start extending that to people with people who have no money. They have to start literally giving them homes. I really believe that right now because not, not with the purpose of changing wealth inequality, with the purpose of preventing the, the spread of the virus, but the effect would be to then provide secure housing to way more people than have it right now. And that will rebalance things, I think. I mean, but, it, but it's kind of what we've seen uh, when we worked with PUSH was to, that, that these private equity firms, they, I mean, they entered into the, to this housing market in 2011, 2012, and now they're all, they are like the biggest landlords on the planet. That's, we're talking about Blackstone, but, but we have a, a company called Achilles. We have a, a, actually a company based in my town called Heimstaden, who is suddenly we were, in, we were in the Czech Republic and they've just bought 40,000 apartments there. And all the money they invest comes from banks, from pension funds. And for them, money is so cheap yeah. And now again, money will be extremely cheap for them. Absolutely. So, and we know for us, <laughs> money is not cheap. You know, we are losing our pensions going down. Many of our friends are losing their jobs. You know, I mean, I, I run a small documentary film company. The, the government says that now 
we can be we don't have to pay the mortgages but we don't have any because no banks will ever trust a film company or a restaurant or something else you know so a lot of small businesses never had any help from the banks but now the bank is supposed to help the bigger business so it's yeah. it's it's a strange moment and i think and i mean what what the lineup of the ceos into the government offices now are big they are coming with their big packages give us money give us money the airline industry the travel industry a lot of big companies <clears throat> and of course i also want governments to help out so it's that's why we pay taxes we should probably pay more taxes so the government would, would be stronger but we but the, the the guys that made so much money from this mistakes the solution of the 2008 crisis they should now be responsible, I would say. And I, we met with, with Saskia Sassen, the professor at Columbia, as, as Stiglitz, and she, she talks very much about how states and governments are poorer now than 40 years ago. And I know why, why the governments are poorer, because the other guys are richer. And let's see one more clip from the film, if we can, sure. if we can get it to play here. With some luck, F it. <laughs> when you look at the political classes, which I hold responsible in part for a lot of the extremes that we have reached in terms of extracting value so that all our governments now are poorer than they were in the 1980s when this sort of begins. The value of all real estate that functions as an asset is $217 trillion. That's more than global GDP of all the countries in the world, of all the economies in the world. So you know that you're dealing with something that exits the domain of what we would call money. They're highly camouflaged extractions because they come in the shape of extraordinarily complex instruments that nobody who's not in that business can understand. The political classes, instead of doing their homework and saying, aha, we have left traditional banking, we could all understand that, something else has happened. It's so complex that we delegate to the experts. Who are the experts? It's the financial sector itself. So, do you think they will go back? Is the financial sector right now the the advisors to the governments on how to act? Oh, a hundred percent for sure. Uh, there, I mean, there would be little doubt about that. When when the coronavirus first started hitting, at least the Western world, and certainly North America, uh, you know, interest rates were immediately dropped by half a percentage point or something, which is a substantial amount. Well, who, who was advising on that? Of course, it was people like the CEO of Blackstone, who is one of the chief economic advisors to, to Donald Trump. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that they are, as I like what you said, lining up, right? Lobbying, lobbying government. Um, and, and, you know, I think some governments are starting to be responsive to the little people, as we say. Um, but Have the question Have you seen any stories out there happening? I saw Spain was doing something. Yeah, um, I think, sorry, Spain and I'm- was, uh, Spain was like lowering the gas and- That's and right. And they, stuff. Uh, yeah, and they, they said that no uh, telephone, uh, electricity, heating, water, et cetera, would be shut off during this pandemic, regardless of whether you can pay. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, I think it's the whole state of New York has said uh, that had put a freeze on evictions. Now, I mean, th this is really important. In some places in my country, there are deferral of mortgage payments for those affected by the virus. So I don't know what that means if you have to have symptoms or I'm not exactly sure, but they're, they're at least thinking um, of this idea of um, uh, mortgage um, not allowing the non-payment of mortgages to result in eviction. I mean, I think that's the idea. Uh, I'm not seeing this globally though. 
Like these are, you know, we're talking about a few states. Or from Berlin, where, where, where Achelius wanted to evict somebody today. Oh yeah, what was that? In Berlin. Yeah. Well, Achilles wanted to evict a, a tenant, but they, but it was stopped. It was stopped by the government. I, I think so, yeah. But I mean, it's, can you imagine that, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's, it's interesting because, you know, as Saskia says, they've made this enormous amount of money and the world's GDP is much lower, you know? So it's, it tells us something about the power of these, of these guys. But and what they, they are too strong, probably. I mean, I'm interested to know, you know, I because I'm a rapporteur, I tend to focus on states. And, you know, I've come up with a laundry list of what I think states need to do. I, I do think there has to be a global cessation of evictions, regardless of whether people can pay their rent uh, or their, make their mortgage payments. There should be no evictions, period. And there should be no evictions of homeless people from where they are currently living. Uh, no evictions of informal settlements. I mean, that's obvious. Um, but I've really focused, you know, most of my um, recommendations at states. I'm interested to know what you think we could be arguing that private actors like Blackstone, Achelius, Vanovia, uh, et cetera, should be doing. I mean, you're saying they have a ton of money. So, so they what? Are, they are extremely rich. And they are so rich and they made it because of governments helped them to be so rich thanks to the 2008 crisis i think first of all all restaurants that have no customers right now they're bleeding all small businesses you know just give away rents rent free month for all small businesses right now and i think also you have to lower the rent lower the rent for people who are right now out of work. I mean, in, in my world of, of, uh, of freelancers in the cultural sector or in the event industry, it's like, it's, uh, there's so many people who are now going into total darkness, you know? know. And it's normally people who don't have, you know, any, they don't have a lot of money. So they, a lot of people will go down, you know, it will be really hard for them to get going again. And as you said, when I would, so a crisis like this is a, you know, it's a, you know, it's a restructure of, of businesses. So somebody will win, somebody will be stronger because, because competitors go out. But it's also, it's also in one way, like an infrastructure of society. We, we, know, we know infrastructure as <laughs> railroads and roads and hospitals and stuff. And, but I mean, I would say also homes are also infrastructure. Absolutely. And also the street life, restaurants, you know, it's also part of what we want to have in our societies. Mm -hmm. And we need, to, we need to protect that too. And I think companies like Blackstone, Achelius, all the names, all these people who own houses, they could actually now step in, lose some money or lose a lot of money, but they could, they could now really step up for the small people Can instead you... of talking about it. Yeah. And I think I saw actually that Spain was about to nationalize the hospitals, private hospitals. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's actually, I, I haven't, I don't know any details about it. I just saw it in the headlines, so don't quote me. <laughs> but I mean, we've seen that already now in the housing crisis in Berlin, for example, or in Spain, that people have been raising words or expressions that we haven't heard for 60, 70, 80 years, expropriation, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and claiming that housing is, is uh, is a human right and infrastructure that society needs. Mm. So if you have a lot of empty apartments around which we have, you have it in, in Canada and in many countries, empty apartments uh, where people have parked money, but nobody's living there. I think it's time to, for government to step in. Absolutely. I mean, and, that... just to, and just because not, this is the moment where governments are creating a lot of new laws. Exactly, exactly. Laws in an emergency, but mm -hmm. they should also create laws that protect people, not these big corporations. 
it, we need some kind of balance. I mean, I can accept that we all are going to leave this poorer. A lot of us will suffer. We will not be able to go on as many trips to the foreign countries. Uh, you know, we have to, our standard of living will go down. But I think we, a lot of us can accept it if we don't see the big guys shooting up. Because now we've, what we see now is like that everybody who is trying to do their job, they study hard, they work hard, they, they raise the children, they, they tell the children to take care of the planet and to be kind to others. And then when, we, when people are coming up and they are going out to society, they see everything is impossible, they can't get a home. And then they see the criminals driving by in Ferraris people who break the rules. So I think it's time to move on to the, 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 the rule breakers right now. Yeah. The people who are putting their money in tax havens, people are, because all those people who have money in tax havens, they are not paying, they're not helping to save businesses right now, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no, I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. And I think what a lot of people may not know is that when a state declares a state of emergency, it's not just because there's an emergency, it enables certain powers, right? It enables them to adopt new legislation uh, in different ways. It enables them to spend in different ways. In countries like mine, where there's um, jurisdictional disputes about you know, who should be doing what, it allows the national level government to get really engaged in areas that they wouldn't normally be engaged in. What I think you're suggesting, or at least what, I, and I, certainly what I've been suggesting is that they use those powers, as you say, to prop up people who most need it and to push away the big actors who are normally acting like vultures and preying on situations like this. Um, and, and I am hopeful because I am seeing these, like we talk, these little bits of, you know, governments understand that what's at the emergency here is a, is a welfare emergency. I mean, it's a social welfare emergency, not just about health, right? People are as you say, they're suffering economically. Everyone is going, most people will be worse off as a result of this. And so I see governments are taking some more bold actions, but I think way more has to be done. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like this idea of the appropriation of properties. I think that's a sense. I, I don't see any other way around it. If governments are prescribing staying at home, then they have to make sure everyone has an, and it's not just any home, it has to be an adequate home. Then they have to, they have to make provision for that. And the only way to do that is as you suggest, appropriate the vacant homes, the empty homes. They can create for themselves the right of first refusal where they, any home that is for sale, condominiums, units, et cetera, governments have the right to first try to purchase those at a fair price. But before anyone else your government should now buy housing blocks absolutely absolutely now is the time as you say they need infrastructure they need infrastructure there are 1.8 billion people around the world who are living in homelessness and inadequate housing those people put the entire world population at risk of getting coronavirus i mean that we have to think right that's how it works so if you have homeless people and they have no way of staying at home, they are likely to get coronavirus and spread coronavirus. And so they have to be housed. Same with people in informal settlements. They can't even wash their hands, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think governments should be, it's like recouping, right? Because they've lost so much of their public assets. So in many cases, this is about recouping public assets. Now is the time. That's my idea. So have you been talking to your government about this in Canada? Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, and so I think the government is uh, announcing more dollars for homelessness. But of course, it goes back to my original concern. I worry that when governments just say, OK, more money, that what, what will happen is the money gets sunk into emergency services and doesn't get put into things like building public assets uh, and, and, and uh, doesn't doesn't uh, get used to sort of push away those big actors that we've been talking about, like Blackstone and Achilles. And now, for example, that that um, condo buildings or projects, construction projects are going down because it, because of the uncertainty of the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I was speaking to a lawyer who works with um, developers in Toronto in particular. Toronto, if you go to Toronto, I mean, I know Frederick, you've been, you see like cranes everywhere, new buildings going up. Well, a lot of those developments are going under right now because everything has stopped, right? Um, and so uh, the uh, one idea I had and that I'm talking to the government about is um, the government should be intervening in those and have the right of first refusal. So they should be approaching those developers before anyone else does and saying, we will take this development off your hands. Uh, and that will help them start accruing more of those, you know, public infrastructure that you were talking about. Uh, that's the bold, those are bold moves. I mean, governments have not been doing this for years and years and years, right? Since the eighties, basically. So it's bold. But now when you say all this, or me, I say they will, they will call us like naive leftists, I guess, you know? I don't know. I mean, I think because this pandemic has changed, like really everything has changed, right? Don't, I mean, I'm sure you're feeling it in Malma. Like when I walk around to me, everything has changed in my city. I mean, it's just a small city to begin with, but if everything is different. And I think governments, are recognizing this is unprecedented and totally new and bold, excuse me, bold things have to be done. I, that's what I, 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 anyway, maybe, maybe some governments would call us way too lefty. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, of course, but this is a debate. And, and I think, it, I mean, you have a, um, a famous writer in Canada called Naomi Klein. And she wrote a book called The Shock Doctrine, which is basically talks about how the most powerful are using the crisis as a moment to grab more stuff. You know, they, for them, crisis is their best moment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so... Yeah, disaster and, capitalism. Yeah, disaster capitalism. And it, of course, and it, you can understand it if, because it's now a lot of stuff is on sale. You know, there will be a lot of hotels on sale because they're they're totally losing money now. There will be a lot of restaurants for sale, a lot of companies for sale. You know, I mean, so so the people who sit on money right now, mm -hmm. uh, and money is for free. That's the next thing. You know, yeah. they sit on money, but they can also go to the banks and get more. Mm -hmm. So it's also a little bit of the instructions to the banks right now because the governments are giving the banks tons of money to to give away for. You know, for for no interest rate. Yeah. So that can be used in a good way, but I guess also in a very destructive way. Mm -hmm. so how, I, do we, how do we monitor this? This? How do you have any plans to monitor this? <laughs> well, I'm one of those people that that you referred to earlier. I'm like reading like everything I can get my hands on, and then I can't keep track of anything because it's too much information right now. Sure. I am. Melanie, so what is your advice then to all people who are, uh, you know, working on this or, or worried about this? I mean, we're talking about all these NGOs that are involved in, in homelessness or in housing or uh, social sustainability or, you know, all these people and, all, and journalists. What is your advice to them right now? Yeah, well, I, I do urge all of those people uh, and including myself, I have to keep focused on these big structural pieces because there is going to be an aftermath to this. And, and I do think that, that we're in this very unique position. It's horrible and stressful, but it is a moment when we could, for example, solve global homelessness. We really could. And in fact, we have no choice because that's the solution to the pandemic. So, so, but this requires all of those people that you referred to, advocates and journalists, to be pushing governments to take these bold and courageous steps and to equalize things a bit and to ensure that the little people, whether it's bi small business owners, homeless people, people in precarious housing who can barely pay their mortgages or their rent, that all that that be the focus of attention, that those groups of people be the focus of attention. But with structural, structural stuff, not just emergency services, not just making sure people have access to, uh, you know, tests for COVID virus. I mean, that's, that's necessary, but that's by no means 
enough and it and we want to come out i mean wouldn't it be amazing wouldn't it be amazing if we came out of this covid pandemic with a huge reduction in homelessness and a reduction in housing precarity i mean that would be amazing right and and wouldn't the world sort of stand proud we 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 got through a pandemic and we made the world a better place for a huge percentage of the world's population i mean to me I, that's the story i think that's like the and i think i like that because i think as i talked before about the depression we all feel right now so how do we how do we keep sane and I think keeping sane is also dreaming a little bit about the future. What 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 are we going to meet after this? That's and I think uh, I mean we have here in Sweden Greta Greta Thunberg, who's now home and she's not going anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but of course she's active. But I mean, this total stop of everything is of yeah. course a resting time for our planet. You know, well, it's amazing. amazing. It's amazing. The, the air gets cleaner, the water gets cleaner. We are, I mean, the, the sale of cars are going down. I mean, all these are resources on our planet that we are not using right now. I understand there are some, a lot of business implications on this, but it's also good for the planet. So, I mean, I take that as, an, you know, I'm, I'm ready to lose my pension. <laughs> If it's if it's better for the planet, so I, in that sense, I'm I'm kind of that's a cool side effect yeah. of this of this crisis, uh, and of course, if we can also can come out on the other side with with not letting the big guys win the game all the time, and and that governments because you know it, it's so it, it's so because the business and a lot of people have been saying. We should pay less taxes, less taxes, less government, less government. And now they all line up in queues to talk to the government. Help us, help us, help us. Hey, come on. Five minutes ago, you didn't want to pay your taxes and now you want the government to help you. How do you factor you think the government works? You know, it actually, you actually need, <laughs> you, the government needs taxes. So, I mean, hopefully, hopefully this can be a lesson for society. We need, a, we need a society that is more solidarian and we need, a, we need governments to function. And yeah. I think uh, governments have been deregulating, giving away functions to the private market mm -hmm. and the private market hasn't been able to solve it yeah. in a good way. And, because, and that's what we see in these clips from Stiglitz uh, and, and Saskia that we played earlier here in our little broadcast i don't know if anybody's watching but it's it's, <laughs> <They record>. it's <laughs> if you're watching watching you can just say hi i love to see leilani uh sitting in her bunker you know <laughs> <laughs> does feel like a bunker actually <laughs> My office. Uh, we're such a small company so we don't we can't infect so many infect so many and in sweden we're still allowed to be out ah Yes. Most people in Canada now are working from home. But, you know, just to go back, I, I do love this idea of this being this, it's an incredible moment and it's super scary and anxiety causing. And obviously many lives are being lost, which is, which is all devastating. But at the same time, the, for me, the idea that maybe something amazing could come out of it is I, I think that's what's keeping me going as I'm sitting here in self-isolation for on day four of 14 uh, with my kids and, and, and partner, you know, so uh, I do love that idea. And, you know, one other thing I'll say is it's, it's pretty amazing to see government official after government official from every country around the world standing up and actually expressing real concern about their people. That's not something you hear governments doing <laughs> terribly often. Uh, it's unfortunate that it's a, uh, this incredible pandemic that's that's provoking that compassionate response. But um, if that compassion could be harnessed into some social good and 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 some human rights protections, um, that's something. That's cool, Leilani. I think we should um, we should keep talking. And uh, if anybody's watching, uh, write to us. We we will also put this. Uh, 
the, this video up so you can watch it later and send to your friends. It's probably too long, but it's it's uh, it's that's how we roll. Too long. <laughs> but, no, but it's uh, it's fine, and and we will. I think we should keep talking like this as well as we are still in isolation and and keep, this, keep the spirit up. Absolutely. So, from Malmo to to Ottawa with love and respect and um, keep fighting. You too. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.